So in the recovery trial, hydroxychloroquine arm, there were almost 1,600 people enrolled who got the toxic doses, and 396 are said to have died. That's 25%. Uh, now, if you go to any hospital, 25% dying from COVID is a very, very high number. So I, I think we can safely assume that had they not gotten the hydroxychloroquine, fewer would have died. Hello, everyone. That was Dr. Meryl Nass in a clip taken from our recent interview, where she is asserting that people died in COVID drugs trials due to the use of toxic doses of hydroxychloroquine. I've subsequently produced a podcast contrasting Dr. Nass's views on the impact of these trials with that of Dr. Klaus Kohlein, who also cried foul on the dosage. But is it definitely true? It seems outrageous that various medical authorities would get such a simple thing as the toxicity level of a drug so wrong. So it's a question we should definitely ask. And it's a question I did ask prior to my interview with Dr. Nass. As part of the due diligence, I did what I could to interrogate her claim. This led me to the YouTube channel of Dr. Dan Wilson. Dr. Wilson is a microbiologist who produces videos debunking what he sees as spurious claims about COVID. Very handily, he's produced several videos debunking Robert Kennedy Jr.'s book, The Real Anthony Fauci. I say handily because Kennedy addresses the question of hydroxychloroquine toxicity and draws on Dr. Nass's work, so I thought this would be perfect. What I found, I determined to be worthy of its own podcast. I'll come to the main issue of hydroxychloroquine in just a minute. Before that, I'd like to highlight a couple of points that jumped out at me as I listened. I think they establish a pattern of behaviour. It's fair to say Dr. Wilson has a condescending tone towards Kennedy's work. He begins his presentation by asking if he's a masochist for even doing this review, and immediately describes the book as rambly. It's clear this is not a review that will be suggesting Kennedy has made some good points in some areas, but not such good ones in others, this is going to be an outright dismissal. The first claim that really jumped out at me was around five minutes in. I'll put timestamp links for everything in the info box. Dr. Wilson claims Robert Kennedy blames Anthony Fauci for COVID deaths in countries all over the world. Let's listen. To sum up the rest of this introduction chapter in one sentence, it's basically Robert going on and on about how everything under the sun is Anthony Fauci's fault. Which is weird because almost everything that he's blaming Anthony Fauci for, he did not directly do. Let me explain. Robert constantly refers to things as Anthony Fauci's lockdown, Fauci's COVID-19 policies, even Fauci's report card, which bizarrely includes COVID deaths that happened in several different countries, not just the US. Anyway, now, this just struck me as bizarre. I'd read the book, and I didn't remember that. How could Robert Kennedy possibly hold Anthony Fauci responsible for COVID deaths in countries other than the United States? It plays into the image Dr. Wilson is creating of Kennedy as just a vindictive man with an axe to grind. I popped my earphones in, put the audiobook on, and went for a walk. This is what I heard. As the world watched, Tony Fauci dictated a series of policies that resulted in by far the most deaths and one of the highest percentage COVID-19 body counts of any nation on the planet. Only relentless propaganda and wall-to-wall -wall censorship could conceal his disastrous mismanagement during COVID-19's first year. The U.S., with 4% of the world's population, suffered 14.5% of total COVID deaths. By September 30, 2021, mortality rates in the U.S. had climbed to 2,107 per million, compared to 139 per million in Japan. Anthony Fauci's report card. Death rates from COVID per million population as of September 30th, 2021. United States, 2,107 deaths per million. Iran, 1,449 deaths per million. Sweden, 1,444 deaths per million. Germany, 1,126 deaths per million. Cuba, 650 deaths per million. I've caught the clip after just a few countries as I think you get the point. Kennedy goes on to list many more of them. It's unambiguous that Robert Kennedy is not producing a scorecard where he is blaming Anthony Fauci for COVID deaths the world over. Only an extremely careless reading of the book, or deliberate misreading, 
could get you to that conclusion. Kennedy is clearly listing the death rates of countries to contrast them with the performance of the United States. That is Fauci's scorecard. How else, other than by comparison, could you derive a scorecard? Let's look at one further example. In this next clip, Dr. Wilson is critiquing Robert Kennedy's claims about lockdowns causing deaths. On page 30, after saying several times that lockdowns were deadly, he says that we have no way of knowing how many people died from isolation, unemployment, and blah blah blah, but then goes on to quickly attribute all of those things to the quarantine by saying that US life expectancy decreased by 1.9 years during the quarantine. You know, maybe that had something to do with a new deadly virus that was spreading rapidly and killing thousands of Americans a day, resulting in a large increase in total excess deaths compared to a five-year average. But hey, what do we know? He said that we have no way of knowing. So, mystery. Again, to hear this, Robert Kennedy sounds like an idiot at best and a charlatan at worst. How can he possibly not take COVID deaths into account when questioning the drop in life expectancy? And who on earth is reading this book? How are his audience not noticing these ridiculous statements? How did I not notice them? Now let's listen to what RFK actually said. We have no way of knowing how many people died from isolation, unemployment, deferred medical care, depression, mental illness, obesity, stress, overdoses, suicide, addiction, alcoholism, and the accidents that so often accompany despair. We cannot dismiss the accusations that his lockdowns prove more deadly than the contagion. A June 24, 2021 BMJ study showed that U.S. life expectancy decreased by 1.9 years during the quarantine. Since COVID mortalities were mainly among the elderly, and the average age of death from COVID in the U.K. was 82.4, which was above the average lifespan, the virus could not by itself cause the astonishing decline. You can hear Dr. Wilson simply omitted the sentence immediately following the claim about a 1.9 year drop in life expectancy. The sentence where Robert Kennedy explains his argument. I don't find the explanation to be super clear. It seems like a paradox that more people dying does not have the effect of lowering the mortality rate if those people are already above the average age. It's taken me some time and consultation to get my head around this, and here's what I think Kennedy is saying. By analogy, imagine an endurance walking race where the average point people reach is 80 miles. Now imagine an adverse weather event causes a whole load of elite walkers to drop out around the 90 mile mark. That will have the effect of dragging the average up, not pushing it down. At some time later, those walkers will not be in the race to retire at the points they naturally would have, and the average will correct by being forced down. I think this is Kennedy's argument with life expectancy. If the average age of COVID deaths is above the average life expectancy, then deaths from COVID cannot cause a decrease in that expectancy. Other factors must be responsible for the 1.9 year drop. I'm not 100% sure that this argument is correct. I could be misunderstanding the way life expectancy is calculated, for example. Robert Kennedy is also taking the United Kingdom average and applying it to the United States. For our purposes, however, the point is that Kennedy does have an argument, an interesting one, presented right alongside his claim. It's very hard to see how Dr. Wilson could not have noticed this, especially as it's on the screenshot of the passage he displays. Let's now look at the main issue of hydroxychloroquine toxicity. Here's what Dr. Wilson has to say. Moving on, of course, Robert also brings up the common and very wrong claim that clinical trials purposely dosed patients with dangerous doses of hydroxychloroquine in order to falsify results. This is easily proven to be false just by looking at standard doses of hydroxychloroquine to treat diseases that it's meant to treat, like malaria. The doses are the same. The doses given in these clinical trials were not dangerous, they were standard, and found to be ineffective. Robert is just making excuses. Upon hearing this, I had to wonder if Merrill Nass, Klaus Colleen, and Robert Kennedy had all gotten it wrong. A simple comparison with a standard hydroxychloroquine dose could undo their whole claim. 
I immediately went to check the references. Dr. Wilson has compared the recovery trial for COVID to a standard dose of hydroxychloroquine used for malaria treatment taken from drugs.com. Recovery was one of several COVID trials that employed hydroxychloroquine, and the dose used in it was as high as in any trial, so it's a fair one to employ for comparison. I then noticed Dr. Wilson actually screenshotted the comparison into the presentation, so there's no confusion regarding what figures we're talking about. Here's a question for you. When you hear Dr. Wilson say, the doses are the same, what would you expect the screenshot of the comparison to show? This isn't a trick question. When I've asked people, they tend to stare at me blankly as if they're missing something. The answer just seems too obvious. Would I be right to assume when Dan Wilson says the doses are the same, you might think that means the doses are the same. But that's not the case. Not at all. If I add up the dosage from drugs.com, which Dr. Wilson calls the normal dose, I find there is an 800 milligram initial dose followed by a further 400 milligrams after six and 24 hours, making a total of 1600 milligrams in the first 24 hours. This is followed by a further 400 milligrams at 48 hours for a total treatment dose of 2000 milligrams in 48 hours. So that's 1600 milligrams in 24 hours and 2000 in 48. Now, if I look at the recovery trial, it also starts with an initial dose of 800 milligrams. There is then a further 800 milligrams at six hours, followed by 400 at 12 and 24, making a total dose of 2,400 milligrams in the first 24 hours. 400 milligrams is then taken every 12 hours, making 3,200 milligrams after 48 hours. To summarize, the normal dose has 1,600 milligrams in the first 24 hours, as compared to recovery's 2,400 milligrams making the recovery dose 50% higher. After 48 hours, normal is 2,000 milligrams, as compared to recovery's 3,200 milligrams, making it 60% higher. The normal treatment ends there. However, the recovery trial carries on for nine days, with a final total dose of 9,200 milligrams. It is of course the case that we are no longer comparing the two dosages on the same timescale, and depending on how fast hydroxychloroquine exits the body, that might be entirely relevant. But given the claim that the doses are the same, it is worth noting that by the end, recovery is 360% greater than the dose we're calling normal. Now, is that what you think you heard Dr. Dan Wilson say? Let's listen to the clip again. Moving on, of course, Robert also brings up the common and very wrong claim that clinical trials purposely dose patients with dangerous doses of hydroxychloroquine in order to falsify results. This is easily proven to be false just by looking at standard doses of hydroxychloroquine to treat diseases that it's meant to treat, like malaria. The doses are the same. The doses given in these clinical trials were not dangerous, they were standard, and found to be ineffective. Robert is just making excuses. I found this astounding, especially since Dr. Wilson had constructed a screenshot showing the doses to be completely different, while saying they were the same. Was I missing something? I thought I'd better check, so I emailed Dr. Wilson to ask. He was good enough to reply and offer an explanation. In the interest of accuracy, I think I'd better read the email in full. Hi Richard. Yes, I'm aware of Merrill and have spoken to her briefly. Frankly, her views don't align with the science at all. Happy to help you however I can. The doses used in the recovery trial were informed by standard treatment pharmacokinetics and pre-established safety runs in healthy patients, as described in the supplementary appendix of the recovery trial. Dr. Wilson then includes a link to that appendix. The doses over time are not the same, but here's what I think you are missing. Giving the same dose over an extended period of time and ultimately equaling a larger total dose is not as important as how much is given in individual doses that are spaced apart. Hydroxychloroquine toxicity is caused by high plasma concentrations of the drug, which have been determined to be safe in the case of the dosing used for recovery. 
What Merrill would have to do in order to prove her point would be to demonstrate that the dosing regimen given in the recovery trial are toxic. But because they were already shown to be safe, I don't think she'll have much luck with that. Okay, so what Dr. Wilson is essentially saying is that although the dosing over time was completely different, as the initial normal dose was the same as the initial recovery dose, that's all that matters. This is obviously a completely different argument to the one made in the presentation. This argument would have sounded something like, Although Robert Kennedy is entirely correct that the doses of hydroxychloroquine used in COVID trials were unprecedented, that's okay because the authors of the studies determined such doses to be safe. I would suggest that argument doesn't have quite the same impact. This is also exactly the point Dr. Meryl Nass contests. Her position is that a theoretical model of hydroxychloroquine pharmacokinetics is entirely insufficient to justify unprecedented doses. And this is borne out by the higher death rate amongst people receiving hydroxychloroquine in the recovery trial and in a trial in Brazil which resulted in legal action. I must acknowledge bumping up against the limits of my ability when discussing concepts such as theoretical models of pharmacokinetics. What is clear, however, is that Dr. Wilson has presented this information in a deceptive manner, downplaying what is, at the very least, a genuine controversy. And so that brings me on to my final question. The question of why. Why does a man who has gone through all the effort of attaining a PhD, no small feat, risk tarnishing his professional reputation by making false and misleading claims on YouTube? What drives a person to do such a thing as this? Is there a financial incentive? The promise of enhanced career prospects? Or is it simply blindness brought about by fervent adherence to a particular ideology? I don't know, but I'll certainly ask Dr. Wilson and publicise any answer. Thank you for listening.